All right, so part two of the unit 1-1 notes. The next major topic we'll look at here in this first section, it's actually section 2.2, by the way, in your chapter, if you, uh, in your textbook, excuse me, if you do want to look that up at all. Instantaneous velocity, right? We've already talked a little bit about that, but let's go back to kind of how we defined all of this. Um, so we know that if I give you at like this time t1 over here and time t2, oops, t2, and I asked you to find the average velocity between those two points. I asked you to find the average velocity between those two points, you would just find the slope, right? Because velocity is just change in displacement over change in time, right? And our, our y-axis is change in displacement, our x-axis is change in time. So we would truly just be finding then the slope. That is a pretty good straight line for me. Anyway, um, we'd be finding that, right? But as we get closer and closer, so let's say that I actually wanted the velocity, not the average, but the instantaneous velocity at t2. Well, as I get closer and closer, right? So here's a closer time interval there, and then even if I get a slightly closer one here, I'll make that a little bit clearer, hopefully. Um, but what do we notice, right? As the change in time gets smaller and smaller and smaller, our actual slope gets a lot closer to the, to the real slope, to the instantaneous slope at that particular point. The reason I mention this is hopefully this looks familiar to you, right? Last year in pre-calc, you guys probably talked a little bit about the, the limits and how those lead into the derivative. And that's the big thing. Okay, so when we work with instantaneous velocity, we're going to be working a lot with derivatives, but that's all because we first worked here with limits. Okay, so the limit is what gives us our definition of the derivative. Okay, and we'll come back to that in a little bit here. But if I want you to find the instantaneous velocity, then again, what you're really doing is you're finding the limit of your change in x over change in t as the change in t gets really, really small, right? So going back to that last graph, if you choose a really small interval of time, then you're pretty close to the actual slope, right? So we're choosing an infinitely small um, change in time, and that's going to provide us our instantaneous, okay? So this is representing our instantaneous velocity. Um, again, in your textbook and on a lot of the homework assignments, if you see a velocity that does not have the line over it, that's indicating it's usually the instantaneous velocity. So unless they tell us that's also a constant velocity, we have to assume that it's instantaneous. Notice then over here, this is our derivative, right? This is giving us indication that this is just how we find our derivative. We'll review that a little bit more in the next couple uh, pages here. But again, the instantaneous speed, if I ask you to find that, it, this is just the magnitude of the instantaneous velocity, right? So the magnitude meaning I don't care about the direction, so if it's positive or negative, I don't care. Um, it's just the, the numerical value of that that I, that that I worry about. Okay, so example one, hopefully illustrate a little bit more. And hopefully this is a pretty easy one, I think, but uh, let's go and get into it. So the figure shows position versus time. Uh, graph of an elevator, at which label point does the elevator have the least speed? At which point or points does the elevator have the maximum velocity? And then sketch an approximate velocity versus time graph for the elevator. Okay, so let's obviously start with part A. That's usually where we start. So at which label point, and this one actually should say, or points, does the elevator have the least speed? Okay, so we're not worried about velocity. We're worried about the lowest speed. Well, again, if this is position versus time, the velocity is the slope, right? So hopefully this jumps out right away, but at which two points which two label points here is the velocity zero. Well, at point A, when the slope tangent is should be horizontal, that's not horizontal, but close enough. And then point C, where that's a little bit better there. Right, so at both points A and C, the slope of our position versus time graph, oops, C, not B. The, the slope of our position versus time graph is horizontal, and therefore it is zero, right? So the slope is zero. At which point does the elevator have a maximum velocity? Well, at point B in here, right, that's where that slope is, at least momentarily, a little bit steeper than everywhere else. Okay, so that's at point B. And then sketch an approximate velocity versus time graph for the elevator. Uh, when it says approximate, obviously, it's not worried about specific values. I do want you guys to all be pretty comfortable with this process, though, so let's make sure we are. All right, what I would recommend doing, um, unless they tell us for specific values, which we'll get into a little bit later, but I would just kind of, you know, ballpark with some of the ma major key figures. I know that at point A, so over here when it, we were at time that corresponds to point A, so if I want to call that T A or whatever, 
I know that my velocity was zero, right? So I'm just going to throw a point down there at zero at that, that indication, that TA right there. At point B, my velocity was the most positive that it was going to get. So wherever I want to mark that up here, again, I'm not worried about specific values. I'll just call that VB. But over here at that time, we had a positive velocity. And then as I go up, up that slope there, the velocity starts to kind of steadily decrease and then gets back to point C. So point C once again then is zero. So we get a graph that looks something like this. Now initially our velocity was negative, so maybe you want to start at, at time zero, where we do start here somewhere in the negative row. Okay, so this is kind of a generic uh, form of what the graph looks like. For right now, I'm not worried about are they going to be straight lines versus are they going to be curved lines. We'll talk more about that as we get into more of the calculus side of things. So for right now, if you were approximating this, I'd look for probably these key points right here. Um, so again, A, B, and C. I would look for those key points, and then hopefully something on the x-axis, or on, excuse me, the y-axis here. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and draw these actually as straight lines, and we'll hopefully see that a little bit more later, but uh, these would tend to follow a relatively straight um, line there. But anyway, and then actually I should say that probably is zero just before C, right? So it actually probably gets down here at zero, somewhere there, and then it just remains at zero for that stretch, right? But anyway, approximating that graph is something I do want you guys to be comfortable doing. Okay, so this is a quicker conceptual example. Hopefully it's a little bit quicker. They want us to consider each of the following situations. So it is one-dimensional motion. Ball is thrown directly upward, rises, and falls back down into the thrower's hand. A race car starts from rest and speeds up to 100 meters per second, and then a spacecraft travels through space at a constant velocity. Are there any points in the motion of these three objects at which the instantaneous velocity is the same as the average velocity for the entire motion? If so, identify and explain. Well, let's just start with situation A. So again, what the question is saying is, is there anywhere specific in that motion where the instantaneous velocity would be the same as the average velocity for the whole trip? Well, for situation A, if I throw a ball straight up and then it comes straight back down, what is the average velocity? Right? Think about the fact that it's returning to the exact same position we threw it from, right? So isn't our total displacement zero? And therefore our average velocity is zero for the entire trip. Okay, so for that first part there, we know the average velocity is zero. Is there any instant during that path where the instantaneous velocity of the ball is also zero. Well, the only instant where that happens at right is at the very top of the motion. We know that for just a moment, the velocity is zero. Now keep in mind, what's not zero up here, right? We know that the acceleration is not zero. The acceleration is a constant 9.8 down, but there is that momentary pause. So yes, there is an instance. Okay, so yes, at the top, right, at the top of the path, the instantaneous velocity equals zero and the average velocity equals zero for the whole trip. Okay, so yes, in fact, there is a point. There is at least one location on that trip up, and in fact, in this case, only one location where it is. Part B, a race car starts from rest and speeds up to 100 meters per second. Is there anywhere where the average velocity is the same as the instantaneous? Well, if we're going from zero to 100, so this is for part B, going from 0 to 100, don't we have to hit every number in between, right? Whether we hit, whether the average velocity is actually 50 or not isn't really relevant. We go through every number, don't we? And isn't the average velocity going to ha also have to be somewhere in between those two? Okay, so a car speeds up from rest and speeds up to 100 meters per second. It hits every number along the way. So there has to be at least one point along the way where yes, once again, the car is at the average velocity. So once again, yes, there is, um, because we hit every value along the way, and we know that the average velocity would have to be somewhere between zero and 100, right? It can't be more than 100 because we haven't gone faster than 100. So there's no way for the whole trip. Um, and then part C here, a spacecraft travels through space at a constant velocity. This goes back to kind of the first part of the notes where we looked at uh, if it's uniform motion, right, if it's a constant velocity, that means it is uniform motion. And if it is uniform motion, 
we know that the since the velocity is constant we know that the average velocity and the instantaneous velocity are actually always the same so yes there are in fact this happens at every point okay so there are many points there are infinitely many points this happens everywhere right or if you prefer everywhere yeah, I just said that anyway um, but yes it does happen for each of these three situations okay so to touch just a little bit more here on what I mentioned earlier with the definition of the derivative right if you remember from pre-calc when that evil Mr. Davis made you learn all of this stuff um, the first time that you derived any expressions it was actually through the definition of the derivative using the limit okay so you probably saw something that looked more or less right like this okay so it's the limit of it should be an equal sign in there by the way let's get that out of the way there we go. Okay, so the limit of f of x plus h minus f of x, hopefully the memories are coming back right, probably nightmares, um, horror stories, whatever. But anyway, so this was more or less my definition of a limit and uh, the definition of the derivative, excuse me, that we saw in pre-calc. Okay, so the reason that's important for physics is because this does, does lay the way for us to do derivatives. The good news is most of the time you do not have to use limits now it's very 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 helpful to understand how this segues to derivatives but for the most part in context as long as you guys are comfortable using various derivative rules we don't have to go back to the initial uh, definition here however I don't want you to lose sight of that I want you to keep in mind that what is actually going on here right and so this is basically just saying this is finding my slope if I think about this as my y1 and y2 value over my change in h value, so if I want to call that change in h instead of just h, but this is my slope. This is y2 minus y1 over my change in x, and we know that as that got closer and closer to zero, I was finding the slope of that tangent line, which is our derivative. Okay, so real quickly, let's just go through some common rules. I'm, I'm sure and I hope that you guys have seen these in calculus, um, and I'm sure you're probably comfortable with most of them, right? But just quickly here. Okay, so the power rule, pretty easy, right? If I give you a function where it's x of t equals maybe t to the third power plus 2t to the second power plus 5. Power rule just says we bring the power out front and then reduce this by 1. So the derivative of this function, which you could call x prime of t, is going to be 3t to the second. Again, bringing the power out front and multiplying it by the coefficient. So we do multiply, we don't add. Um, so 4t to the first, and then the constant term goes away, right? Because we can think of this as t to the zeroth power, and when we bring that zero out front, that zero just negates everything. So the first derivative would be 3t squared plus 4t. What we're actually going to see is the derivative of the position function is my velocity function, which hopefully makes sense. I know we talked about that a little bit last year, because um, we were just ahead of the game like that. We were cool. Uh, but anyway, here's my my first derivative, right? So power rule, you do need to be very comfortable with the power rule. Keep in mind, this is maybe a trickier exam example of the power rule, but I'll just make one up over here. If I give you something like this, okay, so maybe I give you an expression that looks something like that. How do we use the power rule to help us out? Because we actually don't need to make this more complicated. We just need to write everything in terms of a power where x is in the numerator. Okay, so I can rewrite the radical as x to the one-half power, right? And I can rewrite this x to the second on bottom as x to the negative second. So if I take the time to rewrite that, I can once again do the power rule. Bring that up front. I have one-half x. I reduce this by one, so I subtract one, which makes it now negative one-half. Plus, I bring this out front and reduce it by one. Be careful with that. We're subtracting one, which doesn't make the number doesn't make the absolute value smaller, right? It just makes that number smaller. So I bring out a negative 2x, and then this is now to the negative third, not the negative first. And the most common mistake that I see in the past is sometimes you're just going through it quickly and you reduce that down to negative 1. But anyway, then my final answer would be 1 over 2 radical x, since this would move back to the bottom, minus 2 over x to the third, right? If I just rewrite that in form. Okay, so we've got those. And then the last one I want to do real quickly here before we run out of time. What if I give you sine? Well, if you remember, the derivative of sine of x is actually just cosine of x. 
Okay, and we'll deal more with these when they come up, um, but we will see those as well. Okay, so this one, the second part of the first notes.